All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jared Short. Uh, I'm here to tell you about the serverless framework, which is one of, if not the single easiest way to get an API up and running uh, in various cloud providers. Um, so the serverless framework uh, is, I, clearly I work for them, and it is uh, a framework that we built uh, a, a, um, in 2015, uh, built initially on AWS Lambda. Um, and we're gonna talk about what serverless is, uh, what it means, uh, how to do it, and I'm gonna give hopefully a demo. We'll see how well that goes. Um, but a, a quick about me, uh, so I'm the head of developer relations and experience at serverless. Uh, prior to serverless, I actually worked at an AWS advanced consulting company where we specialized in building uh, serverless architectures. Um, my first production at scale enterprise um, serverless application we released in 2015 and it still runs to this day. Uh, and just to give an idea of, of numbers and, and why serverless, um, the, the infrastructure and, and approach to architecture is so important. Uh, we were able to take something that was costing uh, a, a client $500,000 to $600,000 a year to run in their own data center. Uh, we moved it to serverless and it cost about $4,000 a month. Um, so we were able to get tremendous scale, tremendous cost savings, um, operations costs went way down, all with serverless. So what is serverless? How do you do it? So 2014, Amazon announced AWS Lambda. AWS Lambda essentially, uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, behind the scenes a container-based technology, but you basically hand them a snippet of code, a function, um, whether it's Node.js or Python or Java or any more, you can run basically any language you want. I actually made LOL code run in Lambda. Um, you can't use it really, it's not worth using, but you can make any language you want work in Lambda. Uh, they will s handle all of the server maintenance, basically um, operating system and down. Uh, all you have to worry about is your code, your dependencies and up. Um, they will handle scaling of the servers. They will handle um, all of the patching required on the servers. So effectively the, um, the user doesn't really have to worry about administration or scaling, and you only pay per invocation. It's like 0 .000001 cents per invocation. There might be one or two zeros on either direction missing there, but it's very, very inexpensive. So you only pay when you're actually invoking these functions, which means that if you write an API that's only called or used, maybe once or twice uh, during a day or a week or a month, you're basically, frankly, it's free. Amazon will give you a free tier that gives you a million Lambda invocations uh, every month for free. Um, what this means to Jamstack developers and developers in general is yes, servers exist. We all know that in the serverless, uh, serverless ecosystem, servers still exist. It's not like the code runs on you know, hopes and dreams. It's running on servers. You just don't have to worry that it's running on servers or what servers it's running on or how it's even running. You just say, here's my function, please run it in response to events. So event driven is another big part of this. We're gonna talk about what that means. But for Jamstack people, basically what this means is focus on your front end. Focus on building the front end. Focus on your business logic in the back end don't worry about the servers. You don't have to SSH into anything. Frankly, you cannot SSH into anything. We're gonna see that. And you can just focus on that business logic and your front end. Don't worry about all of the other stuff that you normally have to worry about. So this is super small. Uh, hopefully some of you can see it in the back. It's not just APIs. That's something important to realize about serverless and the serverless framework. We have people using it for all sorts of stuff. Everything from replacing that old cron server, uh, you can schedule AWS Lambda functions to run. You can do webhook listeners from GitHub, for instance, to automate and operationalize some of your stuff. Stream processing off of things like Kinesis, um, build chatbots, voice bots, 
Uh, IoT is actually a really huge use case. Uh, you have all of these devices, thousands, hundreds of thousands of devices out in the field. Hook them up to IoT Hub in Amazon or other IoT providers. They'll send payloads of data every so often. If you have 100,000 devices sending in 100,000 or sending in requests once a minute, that's still 100,000 requests a minute that you have to handle. Servers for that is, could be painful, especially if you want to try to roll them or uh, update them, manage them. So instead, hook them up to Lambda functions. Not a problem. It will handle all of those requests coming in every minute, every second. It will s handle the scaling for you. So web, mobile, obviously, image resizing is a big one that people like to use it for. More generally, data processing. Someone wrote um, a library on top of AWS Lambda called PyREN that does a lot of scientific computing um, in AWS Lambda. And you're basically able to build super massive supercomputers that last for seconds. Um, not many things can do that. So how to do it? Um, I don't know how many of you have ever opened an AWS console. It's insane. Um, I, I used to work in, in, as an Amazon consultant, uh, and people always asked me, you know, how, how do you know all this stuff that you know about? And my legitimate answer, and I still do this quite a bit, is I spent about 10 hours a week reading documentation to even have a clue of what I was trying to tell people about. I would pick a particular service or two every week and read it front to back. DynamoDB, front to back, read the whole thing. S3, whole thing. Otherwise, there's no way to know this stuff. Basically, it's just insanely complicated and you cannot know all this space. If you're trying to build a Jamstack, just focus on your static site generator, learning those ins and outs. Use something like Netlify to do your actual deployment. Don't try to do it yourself. Uh, and then use serverless framework and AWS Lambda to actually run those APIs in your business logic. So 2015, uh, Austin Collins, our CEO, was building a startup. Uh, serverless Framework headquarters are in San Francisco. So like any good San Franciscan startup person, he was like, I'm going to build a startup. And I'm going to do it super cheap because San Francisco is expensive to live in. So I want to do it super cheap. AWS Lambda is awesome for doing super cheap stuff. Uh, it's, at that point, it was very hard to actually build and orchestrate Lambda functions. So he built something uh, called the serverless framework. Uh, we've had it since 2015. Um, I think we're at 27,000 GitHub stars at this point. And it was the most widely adopted way of building and orchestrating serverless APIs on AWS and seven other providers at this point. We can actually handle multiple providers from OpenWhisk, which is an open functions as a service, FAS, um, Azure, Google Compute Functions, um, the framework has, has grown, obviously, since 2015. Um, we're going to look at a really strong plugin ecosystem that we have, which allows all of our contributors and community to add new functionality. Even if we don't have it in the core, you can add new functionality to it later. Um, but basically, this framework was built to solve a few problems. First of all, um, you can actually do serverless infrastructure all the way through to serverless applications. So we'll look at a simple use case for an API and maybe a scheduling a function. And we'll also look at how you can use it locally. Um, it solves architectural complexity. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever tried to use AWS CloudFormation. It's basically tens, well, tens is an understatement, hundreds of lines of YAML or JSON. And it can be complicated to wrap your head around that. That's another one of those documentation things. If you really want to understand CloudFormation, go spend 10 hours reading the documentation and you have a fighting chance maybe. So we try to solve that problem. Uh, we solve application lifecycle management. It's a deployment utility as well. We'll, look at, we'll see that uh, in the demo. But you can um, deploy, update, and remove all with the serverless command line. We solve local development. We'll look at that. Um, to us and, and to the company, one of the key parts of what we do is really developer experience. So making sure that everything is, is easy and understandable to the developer, abstracting away complexities when we can, and just providing that experience that people enjoy. And then um, to us, also, vendor choice is a, a big one. Um, not necessarily write your code once, run it anywhere. Rather, um, you are able to take the same utility, the serverless, serverless framework, and if you would like to write against you know, Google Compute or 
um, Azure or AWS, you can still keep using the same utility to do so. So um, the command line interface is written in Node.js, so you can do an NPM install of serverless, do it globally. You can, of course, do this on your local machine. You can do it in your CI, CD systems. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy just to install. Um, and then we're going to look at, at this, but you can create uh, from templates. We have templates out there that are public. You can say AWS Node.js, AWS Python, and it will basically scaffold out your project. Uh, and then deployment. Uh, what we really try to do is offer a YAML-defined file and interface um, for a serverless application model, right? Um, tell us your provider, tell us your functions, where is the handler for your function, basically where is the entry point to your code, and what events do you want to use? Do you want to use HTTP or schedule your function, IoT or Alexa skills? And we'll parse this file and basically figure out what we actually need to do in terms of CloudFormation or whatever your provider is um, to deploy that application for you so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, Lifecycle management, so I talked about this a little bit, but basically you're able to deploy your functions uh, and service. Uh, you can invoke your functions in the cloud if you would like to. Um, you can fetch logs uh, for your activity, for your services. Um, you're able to roll back, remove, all of that good stuff, and we solve all of those problems for you. You don't have to go figure out how to do that in the provider that you're using. I just skipped a bunch. Um, like I said, we have a bunch of different use cases. Uh, these are just a few of the templates. This slide is actually pretty old. There's a ton more out there, especially with the release of Amazon's layers for AWS Lambda, which meant you could bring your own runtimes and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so Node.js is one of the biggest ones, of course, Python, Java. Um, and then our plugin ecosystem, we offer, and the community offers, tons of plugins from everything for uh, doing um, different kinds of auth on your APIs to offering um, uh, static deployment, uh, for instance, to S3 if you're not using Netlify. Uh, we offer, there's a plugin to be able to do deployments of static sites straight to S3, and it will handle the lifecycle there. Um, offline simulation of DynamoDB if you want to do that. Offline simulation of API Gateway. All of those are offered as plugins. So uh, this is interesting. Usually what really gets people to understand why this is so cool, though, is tempting the demo gods and trying a simple HTTP endpoint. Uh, so we're going to do this and see what happens. And we don't have a mic stand. <laughs> so he's our mic stand, sorry. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to mirror here quick. And. Pull open. I'm actually using uh, AWS Cloud9. Can people in the back see the text? OK. So I'm using AWS Cloud9. This is like <laughs> AWS's editor <laughs> um, that runs in the cloud. Um, so I'm using a Chromebook here. It's not, you can run Crouton and things, but behind, backing this is an EC2 instance. Um, that's kind of not super necessary to know, but if things go wrong, it's not my fault or my machine. It's, it's EC2. Uh, so uh, getting started, we'll do um, serverless. Uh, so of course, you can do npm install serverless uh, global. I've already done that. It takes a little bit to do, probably about 10, 15 seconds, uh, because Node. Uh, but we'll go ahead and actually create a new project, right? So serverless create, and we're going to do it from a template. And we're just going to do Node.js. Um, and we're going to call it Jamstack. And I think that's all I need to do. OK, there we go. So behind the scenes, what this has done is actually create a serverless uh, YAML template file uh, that has the things that we need for a minimal deployment. Uh, we'll actually go ahead and do that now so you can see what happens. But So I typed one command, and now I'm going to do serverless deploy. Behind the scenes, this is actually parsing this uh, YAML file. Everything you see that's gray is commented out. The only stuff that matters is like the red and white here. So we have Jamstack running on uh, AWS with Node.js 8.10 runtime. And then the only other thing that we're doing is we said, OK, we have a function called hello with a handler at handler.hello. 
If we go look at our handler JavaScript file, uh, basically it's just this. Um, it's an async function. Async is fully supported, so you can do async await stuff. Uh, and we have our hello function here. This is basically our business logic. Uh, note, I did not start an EC2 instance. I didn't have to click around and like provision servers. Um, I didn't have to click into the CloudFormation console. I didn't have to do any of that. All I had to do was create from this uh, um, command line interface, pull this template, do a deployment. <laughs> Behind the scenes, it's actually going and handling all of the CloudFormation stuff for us, compiling CloudFormation, going out to AWS and running it for us, um, letting us know the results. It set up an S3 bucket to handle all of our deployments of our code and artifacts. So that's all taken care of. So if I actually go look at um, AWS here, we use CloudFormation behind the scenes. Uh, you'll see we have this Jamstack dev stack now. And man, AWS does not like it if you zoom in at all. Hopefully you can see this. Uh, we have a bunch of resources. So this is actually orchestrated right now, five different resources. Um, we're going to look at something else in a little bit and see how complex this really gets. But I can drill in and actually go see my Lambda function in the console. And you'll see our code that we were just looking at in our editor is now deployed out there. So this function is out on the cloud. Uh, you can't actually run it, of course, uh, from an API or anything like that right now. This code is just kind of living out there. I could, of course, click test and get some test runs or invoke it manually. But that's not the interesting part, right? The interesting part, especially for Jamstack people, is how do I access this from a static site? How do, how do I actually make this useful? So we're going to do this. Jump back. I talked about serverless and the serverless framework being event driven. So we offer a really easy way that actually handles all of the permissioning and stitching together of various event sources to your Lambda functions. The way you do that is just define events, say, I want an HTTP event. I want some kind of HTTP request to get to this function. I'm going to say the method is a get request, and our path is going to be hello. We'll go ahead and save that and do another serverless deployment. It should go a little bit faster this time because it doesn't have to orchestrate all of the resources all over again. We already have an S3 bucket provisioned. Um, what this is now going to do for us, though, is set up an API gateway, set up all of the IAM permissions, the identity and access um, permissions from AWS um, between API gateway and our Lambda function to invoke it. And um, of course, set up the paths on our API gateway. So all of that, um, I've written, actually written, written, I think, four lines of code here. Um, everything else so far has been, been handled. Uh, I actually get this get request at a live URL. If you can type really fast, you might be able to get to this. Um, but if we go look, you'll see I have uh, my browser is actually invoking this function. And the function right now is built basically just to echo back everything about the event. You get a whole bunch of information like headers and all of that in your API gateway. So if I refresh this, you'll see I get different, a little bit of different content every time. But this is completely live. If I want to, I can go in and say, you know what, let's simplify this to only give back just our message. We'll save, do another deployment here, wait a few seconds. Um, and CloudFormation, once again, we're using CloudFormation, it will handle the state management. You can do this while people are hitting the endpoint, and it will manage uh, spinning up new AWS uh, Lambda containers to start handling the new request in parallel with the old ones. So if you have requests going on and on, um, that's not a problem. There shouldn't be any downtime. Uh, it will handle pretty, pretty tremendous load while that's going on. So now if we go back to this URL, you'll see we just get this. We updated the function that fast. Now what I like to show people here, we'll see if it works, is uh, this is cool, right? You can, this API is out there, it's public, you can start hitting data sources, DynamoDB, you can start serving back images or binary. All of that stuff you can do from this API now, right? And we didn't have to worry about servers or any of that stuff. This stuff, though, is basically, basically production ready in terms of being able to scale. 
And the way I'm going to show you that, and we'll see if this works. Amazon already banned me once today on my EC2 instance for doing this. I had to get a new one. So we're going to run a load test. Uh, this first one is going to be uh, pretty simple. Um, we're just doing five concurrent users on two threads for five seconds. So there we go. We did that. Uh, our latency is 58.43 uh, milliseconds on average. Um, and in the worst case, it was 590 milliseconds. Um, and a request per second was, on average, 65 um, requests per second. Once again, no servers that we have to worry about. We're just handling that load out of the box. But that's not interesting. Where this gets interesting is when you do something like this. Let's run for, let's say, 20 seconds. Uh, let's do 10 seconds. <laughs> let's do 20 seconds. I don't want to wait that. Uh, let's do 50 concurrent users on 10 threads. Uh, we'll see what actually happens here. Um, my EC2 instance might actually get throttled because of too many requests coming from one IP address. Um, OK, there we go. So we had 1,900 requests per second against our API. Average latency went up a little bit. Um, and we had uh, our max was 1.68 seconds. Um, if I were to run this again, that stuff would improve. And it's because of how quickly they're scaling Lambda behind the scenes. Um, if you were to try to do 2,000 requests per second against you know, like your single EC2 instance, unless you had some really crazy uh, optimization going on, it'd probably fall over. And EC2 cannot scale this fast, even if you have alarms and triggers, right? Um, I've built uh, API gateway systems that are, uh, API gateway to Lambda systems that do in excess of 100,000 requests per second, no problem. And I've never had to wake up in the middle of the night to actually fix one of these things. Um, be, yeah, yay. I used to do Docker stuff. I don't do that anymore. I do this. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's because behind the scenes, Amazon is ma maintaining all of the clusters and stuff for scaling and all of that. Once again, I'm only paying for the request that I actually execute. So if I were to never execute this API again, I wouldn't pay another penny in cost for this to be running. Any questions on what you just saw? I just did that awesome of a job. Okay. So that that part uh, you could do Git or something like that. Um, the actual version control in terms of your code and your serverless.yaml file and anything that you're using uh, to actually run your project. Once you deploy it to AWS, they actually basically grab the artifact out of S3 and then will manage um, spinning it up when they need to in, in Lambda. Uh, you can store this in, in your actual project, though, in GitHub or GitLab or any other Git or SVC, like whatever version control system you want to use. Um, the key is that you know this code and this stuff, um, once I do the deployment, I've handed it off to whatever the provider is. And it's their responsibility to make sure that it's, it's doing what it needs to do. This, this stuff, you know, I could turn my machine off, and that API endpoint would keep working. Some of the outliers that you run into when you're building out some of these APIs, um, hardware needs, longer running processes, mm -hmm. um, you know, long running, um, uh, like memory intensive or computer intensive stuff. How, how do you, you judge what f what's going to fit well here? You know, how to pick a provider in those situations? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really great question. Um, honestly, that's one of those situations where I think it comes down to knowing what your providers uh, have in terms of just capabilities, right? So like AWS Lambda, I think right now can run up to 15 minutes is the the maximum time, and I th think it's is it what six gigabytes? Somebody somebody know? I don't know what the maximum amount of memory you can provision is right now. Um, you can do some pretty intense stuff with that. Um, that said, if you need to break out uh, to something like Fargate or have durable functions like Azure, where they can um, like run over time and kind of get like asynchronous callbacks within the functions, it, it really comes down to knowing the provider. Basically, my rule of thumb is I like to keep Lambda functions running less than 30 seconds if I can. Um, if not, there's other stuff out there, whether it's like Fargate or Kubernetes and like schedule something on Kubernetes. 
maybe that's a better fit um, for some of those, especially uh, um, really intense like machine learning and stuff like that where you need GPUs. Like, don't you're not going to do it on Lambda right now. Um, some of the serverless stuff maybe, but uh, it's, try to keep it bound to stuff where you know it's usually less than 30 seconds in response to an event. Um, some of the data processing on like S3 files where a file comes into S3, processes in Lambda, you can do that. Um, it, it's really situational though. Did I answer it? Yeah. It's, it's a tricky question. I, I, know, I know what you're asking. It's, yeah. Um, all right, we're gonna jump back to our demo or our slides here. So um, I talked about architectural complexity a little bit. <coughs> um, the best way to kind of demonstrate what I mean when I say serverless framework solves architectural complexity. So everything you just saw, this is what this is what happened. And behind the scenes, it actually created nine AWS resources. So I wrote four lines of code, uh, created nine different AWS resources, um, which is these. Uh, in our serverless.yaml, it's 11 lines. If you go look at the JSON generated, <laughs> even if I take out all of the, a, a lot of like the unnecessary line breaks that it does when it prettifies the JSON, it's still 200 plus lines of JSON in CloudFormation, um, which is really painful to write and actually get right. Um, so we solve a lot of that complexity and all of those unnecessary things, things that are implied when you say, of course, API Gateway needs permission to actually execute a Lambda function if I want to hand off an event to Lambda. Uh, so we solve all of that behind the scenes. Uh, event driven, so I showed you the HTTP event. If you wanted, you could, for instance, say when a file or some kind of file gets uploaded by a user, and you can do this in a Jamstack, upload directly to S3, a Lambda function can trigger after that upload and go do post-processing. So resizing avatar images or resizing images in general, applying filters to images, you could do that with Lambda as soon as a file lands in S3, execute on the Lambda function. Um, you can schedule these Lambda functions either with cron syntax or say run at a rate of every one minute or five minutes or once a day, and it will handle running those processes for you. So you don't have to keep that like old EC2 box or old box around that's nothing but your cron box that runs those cleanup scripts for you. You could do that with a Lambda function, and then you're not paying for that server for the other 23 hours and 59 minutes in a day that you're not using it. So that's actually a pretty, pretty big use case as well. Uh, that said, there's tons of different use cases for this, IoT, all of that that I mentioned. Uh, local development. Um, how are we doing on time? Got about five more minutes. We can do it. Can I get you to hold the thing again? All right. So we're going to switch back here. I'm actually going to show you local development, because this is actually important to um, folks that are building like local websites. And you're developing locally. You want to see, usually, how do I do this like offline, right? You saw me deploy to the cloud and hit the API in the cloud. That's not always the greatest, especially if you want to develop maybe business logic in parallel with your um, static site. So serverless has um, this plugin ecosystem about, that I've been talking about. And you can actually search uh, our plugin ecosystem. So let's say search for offline and see what plugins we have that might pertain to offline. So we've got a bunch here. We can simulate SNS offline. Um, SSM, offline scheduler, it will pretend to run Lambda function scheduled. Uh, the main one we're going to look at, though, is this serverless offline plugin that allows you to emulate API gateway and Lambda on your local machine. So serverless plugin install, and our name is going to be serverless offline. Uh, this will go ahead and go out, reach out, grab the packages, uh, pull them in. Uh, it'll create a package JSON if you need it. I'm just going to npm install just in case. Um, so I've installed that plugin, and now if I do serverless and run our new command, which uh, all of our plugins can hook into our uh, command line system and basically offer new options, new command line flags, all of that stuff, as if it's a native part of the framework. 
So now if I run serverless offline, you'll see it boots up a localhost server on 3000. Of course, you can adjust the ports. It tells us, hey, you have a route at get hello. Um, and then if we go create a new terminal here, and I curl uh, localhost 3000 slash hello, I get a simulation as if it were running in the cloud. It runs Lambda, pretends it's through API Gateway. So this gets really useful because it has hot reloading. And as you're working on your business logic, whatever it's connecting to and doing, and you're working on your Jamstack, your front end, you would um, be able to adjust your business logic, have it simulated all locally, and really quickly develop. And that speeds up the development cycle tremendously, um, as opposed to trying to deploy out to the cloud after everything. Not everything can be perfectly simulated locally, um, but this uh, at least will get you most of the way there. You can usually mock other data sources if you need to. Uh, that's all I had for the demos. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to jump back. <laughs> uh, and they worked. That's good. Uh, so we're going to jump back here, finish off the slides quick. Yeah, go for it. So can, can we do uh, generation from um, like uh, Swagger definitions to, to local stubs and serverless? Uh, Yes-ish. Uh, so you are able to use some of the Swagger stuff. It, there's, I think, a plugin for it. We don't natively support the Swagger stuff. Um, that said, I think there's a plugin for it. And yes, you probably be able to do it. I think. Yeah. So the Swagger actually, you could you could embed it into the field in CloudFormation, yeah. And then you could also use a document that plugin, but yep. it's basically the same thing. Yeah. It just does the same thing behind the scenes. Yep. Thank you. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Uh. We already did this one. Uh, so developer experience, uh, like I said, the entire framework is um, uh, CLI itself, and the way it's actually built is on top of our plugin architecture. So basically, the core of the framework is just plugins that we have blessed and said, these are you know core plugins that ship with the NPM install, um, which means that we are operating within the framework on fair footing as everybody else. So anyone else can actually go and write a plugin that once it's installed will override functionality of core plugins um, if, if you need to do that kind of thing. So it's all hook and lifecycle based. Uh, even plugins, so like the offline plugin, for instance, can offer its own hooks or plugin, um, own hooks and lifecycle events that other plugins could tap into as well. So the whole plugin ecosystem is pretty, um, pretty well thought out, pretty elegant, and super extensible. You can always basically write a plugin to do anything you want. Um, I know I wrote like a plugin that would make it so. All you had to do was say, I want like a Kinesis stream, and behind the scenes, it would go set up like 15 resources to make sure your Kinesis stream was always encrypted, always archived. You could replay your Kinesis stream, all of that stuff with one plugin, um, and people just had to put like one line of config inside of their templates. And what that gives us is a really strong ecosystem. There's hundreds of plugins out there that you can go use um, to improve your life and, and make it easier to work with. Um, for instance, a lot of enterprises that we work with in this uh, space will have really complicated requirements, whether it's around security or auditing or things like that. And instead of trying to force those down the devel developer's throats with um, other kinds of um, tooling or things like that, they'll write a plugin that just runs those enforcements for the developer. And the developer just says, put this plugin in my, my serverless uh, YAML file, run it in my project, and it will just take care of all of that stuff for the developers. Once again, developer experience. Um, yeah, so packaging is another big one. Um, packaging for Lambda is interesting. So if you're running on like a Windows box, um, the framework will run. But if you try to take like native dependencies um, from Windows and run it in AWS Lambda, it will fail because AWS Lambda is, EC, uh, is uh, Amazon Linux based runtimes. Uh, and so if you have like Postgres or like MySQL requirements or other native requirements. Uh, if you try to ship it with the Windows dependencies, it's just going to bomb out and have no idea how to run those. 
Um, there's stuff out there, there's plugins out there that will actually, for instance, use Docker to pull the correct dependencies, package everything up, and when it ships it to Lambda, it will have all of the correct dependencies, and it just makes that process easier as well. So we also support all of these other providers. I know I talked a lot about AWS and Amazon Web Services, of course. Uh, we support all of these others, and I think a couple more now as well. Um, Amazon, of course, is the bulk of our, our users actually right now, but we're definitely seeing people migrate towards other providers. Um, that said, we're dedicated to supporting any provider out there that wants to be part of the framework. So if you are operating some FAS solution or for some company, come talk to me. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I had uh, about the serverless framework. Yes? You were, did you have a web task before? Uh, auth I think solution. we did, but didn't they shut that down? No, I don't think so. Didn't they? Okay. But I don't think it's on your site anymore. I don't though. know if we, yeah, I don't know if it, the plugin might not have been supported after a while. Oh, yeah. I don't actually know. Sure. Questions? So when you were talking about packages, one question came into my mind. One time I was trying to install some packages uh, that are over the uh, storage restriction. Were you able to resolve that issue? <laughs> so that's actually an Amazon, for, for Lambda, an, an Amazon enforced thing, right? Yeah. Your unpackaged Lambda function can only be so big, like once it's unzipped, and your um, packaged function in terms of the zip size can only be so big. I know they increased the size. I don't know how big it is anymore. I haven't run into that problem. But there are tricks that you can do. I know the Python packaging um, plugin would actually go and remove like all of the unnecessary documentation and stuff like that from um, vendored like pip files uh, and, and those Python packages. Uh, that said, no, we don't handle that natively, um, but some of the plugins do. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, the company we work at has a couple services that are currently uh, being deployed using serverless. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have some uh, legacy services that either have been deployed on their own like CloudFormation stack or in a case of bad judgment, maybe we're just deployed on various services. Um, but are there any existing, is there any existing documentation or guides about switching an existing service over to serverless? Or like, are there any plugins that help with, for example, maintaining data currently being stored in some service, anything like that? Yeah, so that's tricky. Um, specifically with Amazon, since we use cloud formation, usually if there's like pre-existing resources, you can't pull them into cloud formation. Mm -hmm. And since we're dependent on cloud formation for like our state management in terms of deployment, no. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, sorry. No, good to know. Talk, talk to me about version two later. Yeah. <laughs> what? Kind of, yeah. When uh, provisioning a DynamoDB in uh, serverless YAML file, yes. is there a way to successfully re redeploy that um, without, yes. without, the, without the failure? Uh, because when you redeploy the, uh, um, uh, the YAML file, it uh, fails because the DynamoDB DynamoDB already exists and kind of... Uh, talk to me later. I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Yes. There is a way. Okay. Yep. Cool. What do you, what do you recommend for your development life cycle around? The development life cycle around um, serverless functions being a collaborative offer <coughs> in a collaborative environment or through GitOps or, I mean, how do you, how do people collaborate on these? So like, um, like CI/CD, like team-based stuff, or just like how do how do I write my service and somebody else writes their ser like on the same service? Yeah, I mean, so standard development on a you know a code base, you're gonna have multiple people working on it. Yeah. Control, yeah, yeah, yeah. Test, dev, preview. Yeah. So serverless has the capability of doing something called stages. Uh, you can do like it's a command line option dash dash stage something, right? You could also um, we didn't talk about it. There's like this whole uh, serverless variable resolution stuff that you can do within uh, the file. Um, one thing that I know is actually pretty common is to use that variable system to use like your branch name as your stage name. 
So as a developer, you, you cut a new branch, start developing, do your deployments to the cloud if you would like to or through your CI CD system. And with that um, branch name as your stage name, you shouldn't collide with anybody else and then merge into like your, your trunk uh, of your, your code repository and have that be like your shared dev. And hopefully you're, you shouldn't be trampling each other in there. Um, but make sure you just use that stage thing. You have to make sure all of your resources are also properly named. Um, and either using, you know, naming with the stage as part of the name uh, for a convention or just let uh, CloudFormation, if you're using Amazon, name those resources for you, which I always prefer that practice. Um, but yeah, the stage thing is pretty much the main key for not trampling each other when you're developing. Is there like a reverse proxy or a tunnel built into to serverless to let you share stuff and No, it? so no. Um, with this off the serverless offline stuff, you could uh, use some other like reverse tunneling system to share those. That said, uh, if you're deploying to the cloud with those stage names, basically you would get unique like API gateway URLs or something like that. There's some other uh, plugins that offer different ways of thinking about it, with like stage names being on the same API gateway with like slash stage name slash stuff. Um, but yeah, the stage is going to be your core way of handling uh, dev across teams. Any more questions? I know we have our next talk up. Thank you, Jared. All right, thank you. <laughs>